The craziness of Selection Sunday has finally worn off. We can take stock of the ACC tournament and ask the question, what lessons did the Tar Heels learn to have a successful March Madness run? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Tuesday, March 19th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining us at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch, and I'd like to say a special shout out to all of you everydayers out there. This episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? You ever wonder what adventure's waiting around the next corner? Well, Go take the Nissan Rogue or Pathfinder or or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. You guys, it's so close. Each day that goes by is a closer day to the NCAA tournament, just two days from now. And if you're not already part of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, you're missing out. Come for the Tar Heels, stay for the community. We just hit 300 members on Monday. So big time stuff there and it just keeps growing and getting more awesome. Speaking of which, if you're not part of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord uh, uh, bracket March Madness pool, then you're missing out on that too. It's on ESPN. The link's in the show notes. Come join it all. Now it is Tuesday and that means we've got Trivia Tuesday. Here it is. You're ready? This one was submitted by our guy Davis Wallace. Shout out to Davis for this Trivia Tuesday question. How many Nope, that's the wrong question. I did not change that, but I've got the uh, I've got the actual one down here. Here's the actual question. Forgive me. How many times has North Carolina had both the ACC coach and player of the year in the same season? What year was it? Who were they? And how far did they go in the tourney? Once again, how many times has UNC had both the uh, ACC coach and player of the year? What year was it? Who were they? And how far did the Tar Heels go in the NCAA tournament? The answer for that coming up at the end of the show. All right. A week ago today, I sat right here where I'm sitting right now, and I asked us all the question that went a little something like this. Houston, UConn, and Purdue. Those are three of your four number one seeds. The other one's still floating out there, and we don't yet who know know who it's going to be. It could be Carolina or Tennessee, Iowa State, Arizona, you know, whatever. There's a couple teams out there. And I said, you know what, though? Why not the Tar Heels? Why couldn't it be them? This was after the Duke win to close the regular season, but before Carolina opened ACC tournament play. Why not the Tar Heels? Well, we find we found out it absolutely could be the Tar Heels, and it was. I know there's a lot of people out there um, saying it should have been Iowa State, saying you know the the resume stuff doesn't check out. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Now, what I also disagree with is how low Iowa State was. They should not have been the last two seed. That was wacky. Um, but Carolina gets the one seed, and I know a lot of people are saying because they're the fourth one seed. I get it that they're the most vulnerable that uh, the the West region will have somebody else. Forget that. Let it be the Tar Heels. But before we get to all of that, we have kind of a neat opportunity here after the ACC tournament, before the NCAA tournament, to to kind of look back and use looking back to look forward. I want to ask the question, what did Carolina do right on Thursday against Florida State and on Friday against Pitt and what happened on Saturday against NC State? And, and use some of those lessons learned to translate that into this Thursday and beyond. Hopefully much more beyond that um, as Carolina prepares to play. What do they have to do to avoid an early exit? What do they have to do to be successful regardless of opponent, right? Because sometimes it's like, okay, here's this opponent. You got to do this. But at Carolina, we are concerned more about what are the Tar Heels going to do than how do we match up with that team? How can we do something new and different? To No, forget that. I want to do what we do and make other teams adjust to us. So 
regardless of opponent, what must Carolina be in the NCAA tournament? I came up with six things that I wholeheartedly believe that Carolina needs to be every single game to advance because the margin is thin and Carolina has to be ready. Number one, Carolina must be staunch defenders in the NCAA tournament. As we know, this team hangs their hat. Howdy, partner. On the defensive side of the floor. It's not that the offense is bad. They're in the top 25, basically, in the nation. But it's the defense that is elite. Currently sixth at Ken Palm in defensive efficiency. So the offense is good. The defense is elite. But Carolina has to do the work to defend well. Number two. Carolina, what do they need to be in the NCAA tournament? They need to be rebounders. The Tar Heels have played uh, 31 regular season games, three postseason games. That's 34 total for those of you keeping track at home who can do that quick math. Out of those 34 games, the Tar Heels have won the rebounding battle in 30, 30 of their 34 games this season. Uh, The only outliers are UC Riverside, oddly enough, and then a three-game stretch of UConn, Kentucky, and Oklahoma. Those were the only other three teams that out-rebounded Carolina. Since then, Charleston Southern on through the rest of the ACC slate, and then the three ACC tournament games, that's 23. Carolina has now out-rebounded their opponent in 23 state straight games. They've got to keep that rolling into the NCAA tournament. So that's number two. Number three, Carolina got to make a – what do they need to be? They got to be free throw line dwellers. I said, I want Carolina to just go make a living at the free throw line. What do you got to do to to do that? Well, great question. So glad you asked. You got to get the ball into Armando Baycott. The guards have to attack. The wings have to attack. It's not about just settling for threes. It's about getting enough of the threes that it makes defenses respect you. You can pump, think, and boom, you're gone. Or you drive so much that they lay off. And then you can shoot your threes. Whatever, I don't care. Attack the rim, get fouled, and let's live at the free throw line where, you know, Carolina this season has been making about 75% of their free throws, specifically right now, 75.4. That's 55th best in the entire nation. So Carolina really, really, really needs to keep that up. Next, number four, after free throw line dwellers, Carolina needs to be fast. I I talked about this in terms of what did Carolina do well against Florida State and Pitt and then not do as well against NC State. But let's be honest, the Tar Heels did great work in um, fast break points all of last week in the ACC tournament. Um, Thank you very much. And I want to see more of it. I want to see the Tar Heels run, 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 run. We talked about the defense earlier. Defense leads oftentimes to that transition offense when you can get live ball turnovers. And so that's what I want to see. I want to see Carolina force turnovers and run. I want to see them as they do run off of made shots by the opponent, do all of these things and do them well. But Carolina needs to be fast. So that's number four. Number five, Carolina needs to be, I'm going to phrase this very specifically, RJ centered, but not RJ reliant. And here's what I mean, because there is a difference between those two things, between being RJ centered and RJ reliant. Let's start with the negative of that, RJ reliance. This is what we saw a lot in the previous two years when the Tar Heels, quite frankly, would just stare around and sit around and stare at Caleb Love, hoping that he would do something. That happened a lot. Stagnant offense. Saturday against NC State was one of the few times this year where I've seen Carolina kind of default to that at times. It wasn't the whole game, but here and there, they did. And there's this balance because that is the negative side of it. But Carolina has the ACC player of the year on their team, and they need to focus around him because he is a dynamic playmaker. And so he needs to be the center of that focus but he doesn't need to be the reliance of that focus where the rest of us all sit around and twiddle our thumbs. I want to see RJ be a black hole that draws the defense so that then he can kick to Cormac Ryan or Harrison Ingram or get an entry pass to Armando. I want to see Elliott setting up RJ so he can score and then uh, what give and go, whatever it needs to be. 
So I want Carolina to focus on RJ Davis um, in, in a centering their offense around him kind of way, building their offense around him. Cause that's smart. And it's what you need to do, but not being so reliant on that, that it, it, it is negative. So that's the balance be RJ centered, but not RJ reliant. Know where your bread is buttered, but don't butter it so much that it gets all soggy and sloppy and nasty. I want perfectly buttered bread. <laughs> and then the sixth thing, the sixth thing that I am looking for the Tar Heels to be is, and I think this one might be the most critical of all of them and is why I saved it for last, the aggressors. North Carolina this season, one of the hallmarks, and this is part of that defense, has been being the first team to every loose ball, being the team that comes out with just that gusto. You think of both Duke games. I think Carolina won those games early on because they were the dominant force in those basketball games. I didn't see that Saturday against NC State, and I'm not sure why it is. Only the players can know that. What is it that gives them that edge? What is it that allows them to just be over the top, going, going, going? I need to see that from all five connected dudes on the court all the time. So again, those six things. Carolina needs to be staunch defenders. They need to be rebounders. They need to be free throw line dwellers. They need to be fast. They need to be RJ centered, but not RJ reliant. And they need to be the aggressors. All told, summed up, Carolina's got to bring it every game. I, even this first game on Thursday against the 16th seed. We're still waiting to figure out uh, who's going to win that game tonight, Tuesday night, by the way. I don't care how good or bad that team is. They're, they're going to be one of the two worst teams in the tournament. I'll just tell you now. But. Carolina can't no, no days off. It's got to be there. I expect it to be, but but we're going to see it. So there you go. Now, as part of that, what is what do we learn that allows Carolina to be successful? There is, as Hubert Davis has been fond of saying this year, more to be said and more to be done. So what exactly does a successful NCAA tournament run look like this year? I'll answer that question in just a second. But first, this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. How about the Oregon Ducks? They are this week's Nissan Rogue. This team obviously surprised us all with a powerful performance in the Pac-12 tournament, punching their ticket to that big dance. They say, win life, go rogue. And that's exactly what the Ducks did over the weekend. So take the Nissan Rogue or Pathfinder or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. This episode is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV, which is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as Fire TV sticks that you can plug right into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV shows as well as free and live TV. I have Amazon Fire Sticks on literally every TV in my household. Why? Because I love them. I love the user experience. I love the layout. It's super easy to be able to use. My kids can do it. I also love their little handy dandy sleek remote here. It's got these buttons like this one says Prime and Netflix and you hit that and it literally just goes straight there. So easy. I love to see it. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us right here at Locked On. Also, not to mention that uh, Fire TV channels have great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't done so yet, you really should trust me on that one. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash locked on fire TV. So we just talked about what is it that North Carolina needs to do to turn the page from the ACC tournament to the NCAA tournament to be successful. Game in, game out, regardless of opponent. But beyond that, I just want to talk at a win-loss level of what success looks like in this NCAA tournament. And in fact, I'm very curious to hear your uh, thoughts on this 
as well. Uh, and, and I've got four things written down for this. Number one, this is going to seem simplistic, but success, at least at some level, is just being here. Uh, I, I had the conversation with this yesterday about what a difference a year makes going from instead of talking about declining an NIT invite to talking about, wow, you know, there was some question about one or two seed. We got the one seed like that's the debate we're having now. Not did, did we make the right decision declining the NIT invite? So given last year, given that this is the best regular season and ACC tournament run of the Hubert Davis era, given that this is by far the best NCAA tournament seed the Tar Heels have had under Hubert Davis, I mean, it's just the second one and the other one, you know, outside the top seven seeds. Remember Carolina was playing Baylor after they survived that 8-9 game um, against Marquette. And so here we go. This now is the success. So just being here and being the seed that Carolina is, is incredible. It's incredible. You love to see it. And given number, number two, what is success? Well, given the wild ride, it is the consistency, I would say, of this year. Think about year one. Carolina had the first, what, two-thirds of the season where things were I think we think about them worse than they were. They were okay, but it was not by any stretch of the imagination a great first two-thirds of that season. And then Carolina turned it on, and boom, they were off and running. It, it, we just weren't sure what to expect, and then they just kept winning. Last year, it just wasn't there, but there were glimpses. And so there were, I just remember getting hope at times, and it just couldn't put it together. But then this year, success has been more consistent. There, sure, there's been blips along the way. That's what happens in a sports season. But success, to me, number two, is maintaining that consistency throughout the NCAA tournament, delivering those kind of, uh, what, what I was just talking about a minute ago, those consistent all-in performances that we've come to know from this basketball team. So then in terms of actual distance into the NCAA tournament, what is success? I think the expected baseline success, and this is my third point here, is to make it to the second weekend. So that means winning your round one game against the 16 seed, whichever it is, Wagner or Howard, which, you know, twice in the history of the NCAA tournament, a one seed has lost to a 16. They've won the other 150 matchups. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but it shouldn't. And then that would also mean beating either Mississippi State or Michigan State on Saturday to go to the Sweet 16. That, to me, is the baseline expectation winning these first two games. But the number four, what does success look like for me? I know that once you get to that final 16, especially in this day and age of parity, there is nothing guaranteed. There's nothing given. It's wackier than ever before. I love it outside of, you know, March Madness as a whole. But for the Carolina part of it, I don't want the wackiness. I want the Tar Heels to do work. So I'm going to say, you know, we set that baseline success at Sweet 16. I'm going to say that I think the Carolina fan base would be like when we look back and say, what was a successful year? You've already won the ACC regular season championship. You've already made it to the ACC tournament championship. And so I think to me, to be able to feel like the NCAA tournament was a success, it's Elite Eight or bust. I know there will be people that that would like it to be a level further, Final Four or bust, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to... Um, contradict that. I, I hear that. And I, I thought about making that the argument, but I think there's just something about making it to that second weekend and winning at least one more game. Cause once you get to the final eight, man, all the more, so all bets are off and then you're just doing it every step you can to keep going. So for me to be able to say this was a successful feather in the cap to end the year, elite eight or bust is what I'm going to say. Again, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, now, to, to even think more uh, historically about that, how has Carolina done with a one seed? Is an Elite Eight a reasonable ex expectation? Is it kind of, yeah, okay, well, that's easy. Let's go to the Final Four. Carolina has done pretty well with a one seed. 
this is the 18th one seed. There have been 17 prior. Carolina overall is 63 and 12 as a one seed. That ain't too shabby, folks. I'm just going to tell you right now. Let me give you the results of the previous 17. I'm not going to go year by year, but I'm going to go round by round. They've never lost in the first round. Obviously, we just talked about that. There have been twice, two times, where Carolina has lost in the round of 32. That was 1979, the first year of seeding. There were 40 teams in that tournament, but Carolina lost um, in, in the round of 32. And then 1994 was the other time. There have been two times that Carolina as a one seed has lost in the Sweet 16. That was 1984, the year of my birth, and 2019, which I'm still chalking up to whatever that illness was that Carolina caught um, and then ended up losing to Auburn. Now, beyond that is where it gets really interesting. Elite Eight, Carolina as a one seed has lost three times in the Elite Eight, 1987. 2007, that was the Georgetown, really still feel like Carolina should have won that game. And then 2012, that's the the year that Kendall Marshall got knocked out. Man, that's just the what-if year of all what-if years to me. Four times as a one seed, Carolina has made it to the Final Four and lost there. That's 1991, 1997, and 98, those back-to-back years. And then 2008, where Carolina got blitzed by Kansas. National champion or national runner up, I should say. That's only happened one time as a one seed. That was 2016. <laughs> Painful. Uh, that's Villanova, if you're not remembering. But the the other five times that Carolina has been a one seed, they've won the national championship. Each of the last five national championships, 82, 93, and then all three of the Roy Williams championships, 05, 09, and 17. So that means that Carolina, in the 17 times that they've been a one seed, 13 times they've made it to the Elite Eight or better. That's why I'm setting that as like, to me, that is a successful season and everything else beyond that is incredible and we'll take it, but at least Elite Eight. And that's very doable based on what history tells us about Carolina as a one seed. 13 of 17 times they've made it to the Elite Eight or beyond. I think that's fair. What about Carolina playing in Charlotte where where they will play these first two games? Well, all time in Charlotte, they are 12 and one. Unfortunately, that one loss was the very last time they played there. That was in 2018 against Texas A&M. Carolina was the two seed, A&M the seven seed. They just had this interior presence that Carolina could not contend with. And the Aggies blitzed the Tar Heels in that game, you might remember. Carolina had been undefeated in Charlotte prior to that. So what that means is it's time this year to start a new run. Let's run that up to 14-1 and all-time in Charlotte. Okay, great. So that's a little bit of NCAA tournament talk and preparation. And look, while I might not be ready to talk transfer portal stuff because we're all up in NCAA tournament preparation right now, Guess what the coaches are having to do? They're having to split their attention, so so should we. And that's exactly what we're going to do in just a second. Right after we talk about FanDuel, say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the NCAA tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed like the Tar Heels, it's time to go dancing on America's number one Sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. How about this? They've already got the line for Carolina for Thursday. They just gave a, a line for each possible opponent. Against Howard, Carolina's a 22.5 point favorite. Against Wagner, 25.5 point. Wow, that would be some kind of blowout for the Tar Heels. If you want to get in on that action or any other March Madness action, just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. All right, I was joking about it just a minute ago, but very seriously, uh, in solidarity with the coaching staff, if they're having to split their attention right now between NCAA tournament prep and transfer portal, which opened on Monday, then we're going to do it too. So I bring you to segment three today where we talk a little bit of portal. We won't do too much, but look, throughout March and April, that's going to be a big conversation point. So we're going to do it. 
So I, I mentioned on Monday show, the key thing we're looking for probably is a replacement for Armando Baycott. Unfortunately, there's just not much yet in the transfer portal at that center position. I mean, Monday was the first day of it, so you don't expect a, a ton of people to come hopping in. But while I didn't see anybody at, as an Armando Baycott replacement, I did see one specific player that I would love, love for the Tar Heels to go after if he's healthy. That's the one big caveat. And that is a ACC foe. It is a North Carolina in-state foe. But probably the only one of the other three schools where you would be okay having a transfer come in from for basketball. And that's Wake Forest. Have you seen who it is? It is none other than sharpshooter Damari Monsanto. I have feared every time Carolina has to play Wake Forest in the last couple of years because of him. And I know they've had this string of great point guards that Coach Steve Forbes has brought in, but it is Monsanto that has freaked me out every time because he is a dude from outside. He's a 6'6 forward, and he can absolutely light it up. Now, here's the thing. I said um, I would love to have him if he's healthy. Here's why. Suffered a, a pretty bad injury last basketball season. Came back this year, uh, not at the beginning of the season, but midway through. And it just felt like he was never really fully there. Only ended up playing 11 games this year. Averaged like five points a game. He just wasn't himself. It's kind of similar. You know, I'm a Braves fan. Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, had an ACL right before the All-Star break a couple seasons ago. The Braves went on to win the World Series that year without him, despite not having him. And then the next year, he just he came back, but he wasn't Ronald Acuna Jr. yet. But then, do you remember what Ronald Acuna Jr. did last year? First ever 40-70 season in the major league history. He was the NL MVP. It was a whole thing. That would be Monsanto this year if it's that same kind of progression. Let's go back to 2022-23 before his injury. Before his injury, he played 27 games, starting 21 of them. In that time, he averaged 13.3 points a game, 3.6 rebounds, and a steal. He shot 86.8% from the free throw line, not many attempts, 1.4, and was 49.2% from two. But here's the kicker. From the three-point line, this six-foot-six forward shot 40.5% on eight attempts a game, you all. Eight attempts a game, and he made 40% of them. Are you kidding me? And that's not even too terribly wild. The year before that, his first year at Wake Forest, after transferring up from ETSU, came along with Steve Forbes, where he was before he came to Wake Forest. Damari Monsanto, his first year at Wake, 7.3 points per game, so not as great, but 39.5% from three. That's just one percentage point lower. And still a lot, not as many attempts per game, but still 5.1 three-point attempts per game. And he made a clip of 39.5% of them. So if this dude is healthy, you've seen it in action. You've seen the threes he's reigned against Carolina. Sign me up for all the Damari Monsanto we can handle. So there you go. That's what I'm looking for. A couple quick other things before we get out of here. Um, spring football practice starts today. So be watching out for news from that. We're going to actually start having a, a football contributor on with us here on Locked on Tar Heels, a former NFL player, by the way. So stay tuned for that. Um, but also we got to get to the trivia Tuesday answer. You ready? Again, this was from Davis Wallace. How many times has North Carolina had both the ACC coach of the year and player of the year in the same season? What year was it? Who were they? And how far did the Tar Heels go in the tourney that year? It has only happened one time and one time ever. That was in the 1997-98 basketball season. The head coach, get it right, Dean Smith? No. Bill Guthridge and the player, Antoine Jameson. How far did the Tar Heels go that year? <sighs> Should have been further, but they did make it to the final 
before? So great question there from Davis Wallace. Thank you so much, Davis. All right, gang, it's Tuesday. We're getting so close to Thursday. It's coming up, but that's it for today's episode. If you're not part of the Locked on Tariels Discord community, again, come hang out with us. We'd love to have you there. Uh, link is in the show notes. It's free to join. If you haven't subscribed to Locked on Tar Heels, super easy to do so. Just hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts as well. By the way, as you subscribe, go ahead and hit the little bell notification on YouTube. That way you get notified when I go live on Locked on Tar Heels so you can come tap in with us, which will happen immediately for the game on, uh, on Thursday. Um, and so make sure you're ready for that. I want to remind you all that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk again tomorrow, but until then. Peace.